Well, listen, it, this is an exciting time in the life of the church, and boy, we've had three weekends. We're just kind of back-to-back. It's just so full of all kinds of things that uh, God's doing in our church, and boy, last night, the father, uh, night before last, the father and daughter, I'm so proud of you dads who brought your little girls to that special time and treated them to something really special. And last night, I'm so proud of all you guys. We have such a great church. I was so proud of all that you did, all the food that was cooked, how welcome you made everyone feel. And it was exciting to, to see God move in that place and see some men come to faith in, in Jesus Christ. But that's just weekend one, okay? We got two more to come. We got Good Friday service and we got Easter. And I really uh, strongly encourage you, just beg and plead that you would be in prayer all week for these services. These are services that you can invite somebody to who might never come except for on Good Friday and Easter. Maybe this will be the week that they would accept Christ. You know, we had a man who accepted Christ uh, uh, at the Wild Game Supper. He'd been coming for three, four, five years. Never accepted, never really quite got it, but last night he got it. And sometimes that happens. It just takes hearing more and more for the God's Word to kind of penetrate into your heart. So please pray for Matt. He's going to be doing the uh, Good Friday sir. Uh, message and it's going to be awesome and uh and then i appreciate prayers from me for the easter message and that that sunday and that friday there'll just be a powerful movement of god's spirit just softening people's hearts so that they would give them to jesus christ and then the next weekend d now boy this is the highlight of the youth program this is a a, a fantastic week every year all kinds the enemy throws all kinds of darts to mess it up but just be in prayer for that as well so we got a lot to be thankful for and a lot to be excited about. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, okay? Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning and this privilege we have of worshiping you. And Father, we know that uh, none of us are here by accident, but you've drawn us here today, Lord, to, to worship you, to sing praises to you, and to hear a word from you from your word. And so, Father, we do pray that your spirit would be the teacher, or that you would speak through me, that your spirit would soften our hearts, and that you would meet each one of us at our point of view. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's an old legend that one time the devil was traveling across the Libyan desert. And he came across some of his demons who were trying to, to get this holy hermit to sin. And man, they had tried everything. They tried every every temptation imaginable. And they told him he looked like an old fool out here in the desert by himself. What did, who, who did he think he was? What did he think he was doing? And they attacked him with all kinds of doubts. And they attacked him with all kinds of lust of the flesh. But nothing was working. I mean, nothing was working. This guy was a, a spiritual man of steel. Well, after watching this for a while, the devil said to his co-workers, look, when you're dealing with a really holy person, you've got to take some special measures to get him to sin. And according to the legend, Satan walked boldly up to the hermit and said, Did you know that your best friend has just been made bishop of Alexandria? And as the legend goes, a look of malignant envy slowly spread across that hermit's face. Well, it's just a legend. Boy, but doesn't it have a ring of truth to it? See, a lot of godly people who are pretty good, pretty good at resisting most of the sins that tempt us, often find themselves victims of the sin of envy. And this morning, as we can continue the, the ninth week in our Proverbs series, we want to try to see if we can gain some wisdom from God's Word for battling this green-eyed monster of envy. Okay. In, our, in order to get our battle plans in, the first question we need to ask is, well, what is envy? Well, what is it really? And the first thing we need to understand that it's different from jealousy. Sometimes we interchangeably use those words, but in the scriptures, you know, jealousy, that's when you're worried or you're upset because you think somebody else is going to try to take away something that is exclusively yours. You know, a jealous husband, rightfully you know, is jealous. He doesn't want another, uh, uh, you know, uh, man running away with his wife. And God is called a jealous God. You know, he doesn't want. We are his people, his exclusive people. He doesn't want us to follow other gods or other idols. But envy is very different from that. Real different. Here, here's the definition of envy. 
It is a malicious, grudging regard for the perceived advantages which another person is enjoying. Envy, what is it? It's wanting for yourself what someone else has, resenting the fact that they have it and you don't. Envy, what is it? It's having sorrow about someone else having something you wish you had instead of them. And do you know where envy always begins? It always begins here. Envy begins when comparing yourself to others, you feel inferior and you feel deprived. You compare yourself to others, and you feel inferior and deprived. Well, this is hard to avoid being envy, envious, you know, because, you know, our whole society is just obsessed with comparisons. And, and, and your parents, you know, they may have compared you to your siblings, your brother or sister. Your parents may have compared you to your, your own friends. Your parents may have compared you to your cousins or your second cousins. And then you get comparisons all over the place with, with teachers, and coaches. You know, you're compared with the grades of other people on standardized tests. You know, you're compared at performance evaluations at work and athletic contests and beauty contests and who's making the most money contests. We're always comparing ourselves. We're always being compared with others. And so it is amazingly easy that we catch this disease, which I like to call comparisonitis. Comparison. You can't find a drug for, for it at, at, at the pharmacy at Walmart with Danny. He doesn't, he's fresh out. I asked him this morning. But co comparisonitis, it, it's, it's a bad sickness. And when at the end of the day, you compare yourself to others and you end up feeling that somebody else is smarter than you, somebody else is more athletic, somebody else is prettier or more popular or more wealthy or more successful or better than you or whatever, it is real, real easy for us to start envying that other person. You know, advertising in our country is, is one of the primary catalysts that just feeds this, this monster of envy. And did you know that in the United States alone, do you know how much money is spent every single day on advertising to get you to want something that somebody else has? Six billion dollars a day. And all that advertising kind of has the effect. You know, we see all this stuff. We see all the stuff that other people have or other people are. And you feel deprived. You feel inferior because you don't have that. You're not them. And, and it just doesn't seem fair. So you find yourself just eaten up with envy. It's a pretty pervasive problem. So, next question. How does God feel about Short and simple, he doesn't like it at all. Not even a little bit. In fact, this is such a serious sin that he included it in the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments. And in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, God says, you shall not covet. That's another word for envy. Covet your, your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And do you see, it's, it's a sin, guys, and I hope you'll walk away this morning feeling and knowing, hey, God does not take this sin lightly. And so in Proverbs, we read, Proverbs 3.31, do not envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. Proverbs 24, verse 1, do not envy wicked men, do not desire their company. And in the New Testament, boy, you know what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1? He just flat out says, Therefore, rid yourselves, get rid of this, all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, slander of every kind. Envy is something that flat out does not have any place in a Christian's life. You know, I think one of the places in Scripture where we see most clearly God's extreme displeasure concerning the sin of envy is in Numbers chapter 12. You can turn there if you want. I'm going to read some of that, that to you. And in this chapter, let me set the scene. You've got Aaron and you've got Miriam, and they're the, the brother and sister of Moses. And Aaron and Miriam, you know, they get envious of Moses' leadership position. Remember who Miriam was? You know, she was that older sister, and she watched her little baby brother, and he's in the bulrushes in the basket, you know, to save his life. And it was because of Miriam's quick thinking that she suggested to Pharaoh's daughter who found baby Moses, said, you know, I think I could find somebody to nurse that little baby if you like. Of course, she goes right to Moses' mother, and it works out well. 
But anyway, Moses goes to the royal palace. They stay as slaves. And so Miriam watches her little brother grow up in the lap of luxury. Pharaoh's court and the royal household of Pharaoh. While she and the rest of the Jewish nation live as Pharaoh's slaves. And then it gets even worse. God uses Moses to most miraculously, you know, take his, his people out of bondage in Israel. And all of a sudden, you know, he did the ten plagues and all that. And then they're out in the wilderness, they're heading to the promised land. And that brings us up to Numbers 12. And we read this. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Now, don't be put off the track. That's just a smoke screen. This wife, this, that had nothing to do with it. The real issue at hand is that the green-eyed monster of envy had sunk its teeth into the necks of Miriam and Aaron. And this comes out in the next verse. They say, has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us, say Miriam and Aaron? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone on the face of the earth. And at once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. Uh Uh-oh. So the three of them came out. And then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent, and he summoned Aaron and Miriam. And when both of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. Almost like, read my lips, okay? When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, there stood Miriam, leprous like snow. And Aaron turned towards her and saw that she had leprosy. And he said to Moses, please, my Lord, do not hold against us the sin we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, oh, God, please heal her. So Moses cries out to heal heal her, and and he does, but not right away. He, He has Miriam go outside the camp in seclusion as a leper for seven days. And then he heals her. And the whole camp stops and waits till she's healed. And then they move on. God does not mess around when it comes to this serious, serious sin of envy. But why? Why does God react so strongly against this particular sin of envy? Well, I'll tell you why. Here's why. Because God knows how terribly destructive This terrible sin of envy can be. Which leads to the next question, then what are the evils of envy? I'm sure there are many. Let's look at four of them together. You know, today is Palm Sunday. Five days we're going to be celebrating Good Friday, which is the day when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross to pay for all of our sins. But do you know why it was that the religious leaders had Jesus killed? Envy. Envy. It's the reason why Jesus was killed. And that's one of the reasons it's so bad. And when Jesus hit the scene, you see, you know, suddenly the throngs of people, man, they were just following Jesus. They were hanging on his every word, but they weren't doing that for the Pharisee. And Jesus performs all these amazing miracles. He feeds 5,000 people with just a little bit of fish and bread, and he raises people and cures all the illness. But you know, the Pharisees aren't doing any of that. No miracles are coming from them. Jesus teaches a mass. They sit there and listen to him for day after day. And and they say, no one has ever taught like this. But certainly the Pharisees have never taught like this. And Jesus is more popular than the religious leaders are. And he's kind of taken away their power base. You know, the religious leaders and and they people used to revere them and used to think they were the best and, and in charge and all that. In short, they envied Jesus so much, they killed him. They killed him. And Matthew tells us that Pilate, Pilate knew exactly what was going on with these guys. He says in Matthew 27, 18, for he, Pilate, knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. There it is, black and white. 
It seems that envy is a very deadly sin. It was because of envy that Cain murdered Abel. It was because of envy that Joseph's own brothers, uh, you know, delivered him over to be sold into slavery in Egypt, and they took his beautiful robe that they envied so much, and they put it in some lamb's blood, and they took it on and said, oh, Dad, we're so sorry, but, you know, Joseph and that lion ate him. So sorry. And boy, are we ever glad he's out here. Because of envy, King Saul spent 14 years trying his best to try to kill David. Make no mistake about it, God hates envy. He hates it because it's dangerous. It's a poisonous. It's a powerful emotion. And yes, it can actually be deadly. Deadly. It can destroy things, destroy people. Here's another evil of envy. It expresses a profound feeling of discontent and ingratitude to God for the person he has intentionally made you to be. Discontent. Ingratitude. Listen, you know that God never makes mistakes. Never has. Never will. And so when he made us, he made us the way he wanted to make us. No mistakes. He precisely gives us the gifts, us the abilities that he specifically wanted us to have. And so that being the case, we don't need to envy somebody who has different gifts, different abilities than, than we do. Talking about spiritual gifts, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12, and he says, all these spiritual gifts are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one, how? Just as he determines. He determines exactly what gift he's going to give to what person. You know, Moses, when God told him he wanted him to deliver the people out of his, whoa, Mo, you got the wrong guy. I, not, not me, God. I don't want to. He was just dragging his feet all halfway across the desert. And in Exodus chapter 4, when God wanted Moses to go speak to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, listen to what he says. Oh, Moses says, oh, Lord, I. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. Can't do it. What does God say? The Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go and I will help you speak and teach you what you are to say. See, God gave Moses the very mouth that he wanted him to have. And with that mouth and with the Lord's help, he could do whatever it was that God was going to call him to do. Listen, this you, you know what something God really wants? He just wants, he longs for you and me to be content with how he has specifically chosen to make us. To be content with the gifts and the abilities that he has chosen to give us. And that's hard because sometimes we kind of forget that, you know what? God's the potter, we are the clay. And he forms and shapes you the way he wants to form and shape you. But so often we forget about that. Instead, hey, I, I want to have what he has. Oh, I want to be the person that he is. In Romans 9, 20, people are complaining to God about some of the ways that he works. And Paul says this, who are you, a mere human being, to criticize God? Should you, the thing that was created say to the one who made it, why have you made me like this? I don't like it. Can you see? How very, very wrong envy is. Bottom line, at its very core, envy is a lack of contentment with God. It's a lack of contentment with what he has provided for you. So instead of complaining about who you are and, you know, what you have and envying the way other people have and other people are, we are to thank God for the very unique person that he has made you to be. Okay, here's another terrible in evil of envy and it's this it sucks the joy right out of your life just sucks the joy right out of your life proverbs 14 30 boy this is so revealing uh, about the evil of envy it says this a heart at peace gives life to the body but envy rots the bones what that's saying what that's saying it's telling us that envy just eats us up inside and, and it makes us miserable and it makes us weak dr bruce walkie a hebrew scholar commenting on this verse says envy is like bone cancer that rots the most firm components of the body and shortens a person's life 
You know, we can see this kind of devastating effect, this rottenness of the bones. We can see how envy just sucks the joy right out of your life in Psalm 73. Great psalm. And it's not written by David. It's written by the Asaph, who was his choir director. And, and in this psalm, he, what happens is Asaph, he is just eaten up with envy when he sees these arrogant, these wicked people prospering and doing just great. And Asaph says in verses 2 and 3 of Psalm 73, But as for me, my feet had almost slipped, almost fell off the precipice. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And then he says this, talking about, hey, this is what they're like. Hey, the wicked guys, you know, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from the burdens common to man. They're not plagued by human ills. Verse 12, this is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They increase in wealth. Nasib is thinking, what's the deal, God? And here I am, I'm trying to be a faithful follower of yours, and I've got all these struggles and all these trials and all this stuff I'm going through, but the bad guys, the people don't give you the time of day, the people who break every rule and book, everything's coming up roses for them. Verse 13, surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. See what's going on there? Asaph is envious that the bad guys seem to be doing a whole lot better than the good guys. Ever felt that way? The crook gets the deal instead of you because you were honest and he wasn't. The person at work who manipulated and lied and cheated gets promoted and you get demoted. The girl with loose morals at school it is very popular with the guys. Man, she goes out every weekend. Her phone's always ringing while you, holding on to God's morals, are sitting at home and the phone doesn't ring a whole lot. It's hard not to envy the wicked when they seem to be doing very well. But then in verses 21 and 22, we see how envy has rotted his bones. We see, we, he says, just suck the joy right out of his life. Asaph says, when my heart, you can just feel the pain in this. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. And what that's telling you, what that's telling me, if you don't do something about envy, it's going to eat you up. It's going to eat you up. It's going to just siphon off your joy in the Lord. Listen, joy and envy, you know what? Funny thing about joy and envy, they can't coexist together in your heart. If you are envious of somebody, joy is gone. Well, here's one more evil of envy, and that is that it destroys community. Destroys community. You know, something that God wants so much, God wants so much for his children to get along. Don't you want that for your kids? You know, then it just hurts you when the brother and sister are fighting and screaming and bickering and all that. You just hate that. It's so nice when they're playing sweetly together. And that's what God wants for us. He wants his children to get along. In fact, you know, Jesus says, John 13, 34, 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another that way. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. How? By how many neat programs you got? By how many, you know, great great people have sitting in church? No. This is how they're going to know if you love one another. If you love one another. And when Paul uh, describes this, this, this love, this agape love he's talking about, inspired by God, he says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, love is patient, love is kind. It does not end. Love does not envy. So if you are envying someone, you are definitely not loving them because love does not envy. In fact, you know what envy does? It destroys that relationship you're going to have with that person. And that was the danger. That was the danger there was with this envy of Miriam and Aaron over the, their brother Moses in his leadership position. Their envy was it was just driving a wedge between them. It was separating them. And if, if it, nothing had happened, if God hadn't taken care of this, you know, it would have been all kinds of resentment, all kinds of bitterness. Who knows? There might have been a rebellion against Moses. And, and, and so God, he took care of the problem, struck Miriam with leprosy. Whoa, God. Wow. Doesn't that seem a little severe, God? I mean, is that a little over the top? Was her envy really that bad that he had to give her leprosy? 
Come on, God, that's a little extreme, isn't it? You know, all of us Saints fans have been reeling from the severe punishment that the Saints are having to pay for the whole bounty gag mess. Are you kidding? Our coach suspended for an entire year? But the NFL commissioner gave this serious, serious, severe consequence because he was making a statement. And here's the statement. This bounty thing will not ever be tolerated in the NFL, period. Well, in this severe discipline of leprosy for Miriam, God was making a statement. And here's the statement. Envy will simply not be tolerated, period. God had placed Moses in this leadership position over here. Not, not Miriam, not Aaron, Moses. That's who he put there. And, and to envy that for Miriam, you know, to want to be the leader instead of Moses, she was bucking who? She was bucking God. She was rebelling against him. And that was going to cause all kinds of serious problems for the entire nation of Israel. You see, God knows that envy separates instead of uniting. And he knows that envy is, is divisive and it drives people into isolation and loneliness and it separates and it divides. As James says in James 3.16, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, listen to this, there you find disorder and every evil practice. That's a strong statement. That's a really strong statement. And let me tell you, envy can do its dirty work in a lot of different places. Envy can do its dirty work in an office or a company. Envy can do its dirty place in a school. Envy can do its dirty place in a family. Envy can do its dirty work on a team. And you know what? Envy can do its dirty work in a church. All right, envy. Boy, would you agree? It's pretty serious. It's a devastating sin. So how can I know if I'm envious of somebody? I'm not envious. You know, I'm, it doesn't really apply to me. Well, I got some envy indicators, and I want you to check yourself out as I go through these, these, this list of things. All right, here's the first question, first envy indicator. Are you upset when someone you know advances financially or socially? Somebody gets a raise, and somebody moves into a much nicer neighborhood. Somebody moves into a more prestigious circle of friends, and you're left behind, and are you inwardly upset about that? Number two, do you feel pain because of another person's success? Sir John Gilgood was one of the most talented and brilliant British actors around. Uh, I think it was the butler in Arthur, the movie there. But he, he did a lot of different things. But in his autobiography, he says this. You know, Sir Lawrence Olivier was another brilliant British actor. Listen to what Sir John Gilgood says in his autobiography. He says this, when Sir Lawrence Olivier played Hamlet in 1948, and the critics raved, I wept. Wept. He felt pain because of another person's success. He was envious. He didn't want him to have He wanted him to have that success. The green-eyed monster of envy had pounced on Sir John Gilgood. Number three, do you belittle the accomplishments, the talents, or the appearance of others? That's a pretty good indicator that you might be envious. Number four, are you tempted to badmouth or cut down a person to whom you feel inferior? If so, chances are good that you're envious of that person that you're cutting down and badmouthing. Number five, are you secretly pleased when a friend or even a loved one suffers a setback? You're probably envious of that person. Okay, if this green-eyed monster has bitten us then, What's the antidote for this poison of envy? First thing you have to do is admit that you're envious. Can't be in denial about it. You know, on the starting point is to admit that yet you're envious. Admit it to yourself. You know, grab the bull by the horns. Go ahead. This is, yeah, yeah, I, I answered yes to some of those indicators. And, you know, we, we can play around with this and we can rationalize it. We can call it other names and we, we can dismiss it and we can minimize it. We do all that. Guess what? The poison's still there. It's still oozing around inside. Guys, we've got to get that poison out. 
And I encourage us to pray what I often encourage us to pray. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, where David prays, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Pray, God, I'm envious of somebody. Show me. Bring it to the surface of my consciousness right now, today. And you know, this can be a very freeing thing. It really can. You know, discovering that you are envious, you know, might explain a whole lot of the wrong stuff going on in your life because it is like a poison, and it poisons your whole life. So you can identify this thing and admit it and start to work on it. Boy, it, it can just set you free. And having admitted it to yourself, then you admit it to God. Well, I admit it to God. He already knows. Yes, he already knows that he wants you to confess it. He wants me to confess it. He wants us to confess it and let him begin to lance the border, to deal with this anger. And then, in some cases, you know, when it's needed to bring healing or restoration to a relationship, you know, you, to confess your envy to the person that you're envious of. Ooh, that'd be hard, huh? But you know what? It can be very healing because it can bring to light, can bring out of the darkness and into the light this evil sin so that it can be dealt with and exposed. Okay, here's another part of the antidote to envy. And, and this is it. Realize that the perfect life of the person whom you may envy may not be so perfect. Might just be kind of an illusion. Boy, it looks like they've got it so great. Maybe they really don't have it so great. Edward Arlington Robinson drives home this point in his famous poem, Richard Corey. I, I would sing Simon and Garfunkel's song, Richard Corey, but I don't think you enjoy it. So I'm going to read Edward Arlington Robinson's poem instead says this, <laughs> great poem. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean favored, imperially slim. He was always quietly arrayed. He was always human when he talked, but still he fluttered pulses when he said, good morning. He glittered when he walked. And he was rich, richer than a king, admirably schooled in every grace. In short, we thought he was everything to make us wish we were in his place. So on we worked, waited for the light. We went without meeting, cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. It's easy to envy somebody, but you know, so often you don't know the whole story. You don't know that person's burdens. You don't know that person's problems and struggles and the things that keep him up at night. So don't envy those perfect people because they're probably not so perfect. Another thing to help us in the battle against envy is to use envy to, mo envy to motivate yourself to change. If you're envious of somebody else's weight, man, that person, they can get that, that dress size and all that kind of stuff. You know, instead of being envious, let that motivate you, hey, to go out and join Weight Watchers. That, you know, let that motivate. Hey, you know what? I'm going to start walking around the block every night. You know, I'm, I want to get into that dress size. D, learn to rejoice with those who rejoice. Well, Romans 12, 15, Paul tells us to do that. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those, with the, mourn with those who mourn. Have you ever noticed that it's a whole lot easier to mourn with those who mourn than it is to rejoice with those who rejoice? Not terrible, but, but, you know, it is. But isn't that petty? Don't want to be that way. So here's a challenge. Here's a challenge I am hereby issuing to all of Community Bible Church this week. Okay, here's the challenge. Next time a friend of yours gets a promotion or gets a brand spanking new car, the next time your girlfriend uh, loses 10 pounds, uh, next time your friend gets that promotion, uh, and next time their kids make the honor roll, the next time something good happens to somebody else that is not happening to you, you be the first person to congratulate him. You be the person that sends him balloons to the office. You be the person that calls him up and says, way to go. I'm so happy for your success. And you know what? You get in the habit of doing that, and that old green-eyed monster of envy is going to kind of start to shrivel up and die. But here is perhaps the most powerful antidote to envy. And here it is. Base your contentment and significance in God. Base your contentment, your significance in God. 
hey, remember our friend Asaph back in Psalm 73? We kind of left him in a bad place. And he was he was the guy who was just eating alive because the bad guys were doing great and the good guys were suffering. And his life seemed to be so hard and difficult. Well, how did Asaph climb out of that pit of joy-sucking evil? Here's how. Big turning point. Verse 23. Then suddenly he lifts his head up and to the Lord, and he says, yet, boy, that's the turning point, yet, had all this envy, all this horrible things, but yet, he says, I am always with you, God. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion for it. Ever. But as for me, it is good to be near to God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Wow. What a transformation. Well, what happened? Here's what happened. He took his eyes off of what seemed like the favorable circumstances other people were having, and he started looking up, and focusing on God and how awesome his God was. And all started thinking about all that God had done for all the blessings he'd given him and how income terribly valuable his relationship with God is to anything else in the world. And, and, and you know, here's what Asus was saying. You know, God, God is always there for him. No matter what, through thick and thin, he's always there. And God, his God, holds him by the right hand. He guides him through all the messes and all the difficulties and, and stuff we go through in life. And God is going to take him into glory, into heaven one day, where he'll spend eternity with him. Nothing on earth even be begins to compare with how great his God is. And that's what we sang this minute. Our God is great. There's none greater. And God, his strength, his hope, he, he was his everything. And listen, when God is that important to you, and when he is the number one most important thing in your life, when you're basing your self-worth and your self-esteem and how you value yourself on God and his love for you, you're not going to have a real big problem with anything. It's just not going to be something that you're going to have to grapple with too much. Remember the movie Rocky? Rocky 1, I think they made 4, but Rocky 1. You know, uh, remember Rocky says to Adrian, I just want to go to distance. Adrian says, why? Rocky says, then I'll know that I'm not a bum. Boxing. Doing that well. Hanging in there, being able to still be standing on the feet, on the seat when that last bell rings. That's what gave his life meaning. That's what made him feel like he was worth something. That was made, made him feel like, I'm not a bum. What's it for you? What, what, what gives your life meaning? What accomplishment, what achievement, what thing in your life makes you feel like you're not a bum? You're valuable. You're worth something. Listen, if that something is not God and, and his love for you, if that something is not your relationship with him and knowing that he delights in you as his child and that he loves you and he died for you and he wants to spend all of eternity with you, if that is not the deepest consolation of your heart, if God is not at the bottom, the reason why you don't feel like a bum, you know what? You're going to be struggling with envy for the rest of your life. Because you'll always be comparing yourself to other people to try to make yourself feel good about yourself. So how do we do it? How do we base our, our significance and contentment in God? Well, let me suggest three ways. One, thank God for the incredible goodness and grace that he has shown you. In other words, instead of focusing on what you don't have, think about what you do have, what God has blessed you with, what he's uniquely given to you. See, the only way, only way you can get rid of the poison of envy, kind of just get it out of your system, is to realize this. Whatever gifts and abilities you have come from God. And guess what? Whatever gifts and abilities somebody else has, that comes from God, too. That's God's business, not ours. You know, Rick Warren has something really good in this regard. He says this. Envy is resenting God's goodness to others and ignoring God's goodness to me. Well, doesn't that, that kind of capsulize what we're saying this morning? Let's repeat that together. Ready? One, two, three. 
Envy is resenting God's goodness to others and ignoring God's goodness to me. That's what, what it is. But you know what else really helps us in overcoming envy? It's this, to rest in God's sovereign control over everything. And that's exactly what Asaph does. You know, in the very last verse of Psalm 73, he says, I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. That's his refuge. That's his hideout. That's the place where he goes when he starts to feel envious of other people. Where does he go? He rests in the fact that God is sovereignly in control of everything. Boy, let me tell you, that is so important for Julie and me. It's such an important thing for us, such a refuge for us, you know, when we, in dealing with this whole deal of our son dying of cancer at 26. Now, if Bill gets cancer, boy, all of you, hundreds of people all over the country are praying fervently for him to be healed. And he has the privilege of going to the best place in the world to treat his particular kind of cancer. And, and, and But he died. He died. And you know, when I hear about other people who have they had cancer, and they've got a lot of people praying, they got some great medical treatment, and they live, and they, they're in remission. They get healed. It would be so very easy for me to envy that person. It's so easy for me to wonder, well, why did God heal them? Why didn't he heal my son? By the grace of God, Julie and I don't. I mean, we just really don't. In fact, we're thrilled when somebody gets, gets over cancer. That's just, that's just joyous news to us. Well, why? The only reason why is because we rest in the fact that God is sovereignly in control of everything. That's our refuge. That's our hideout. That's what we hang on to. We know God loves us. We know God loves Bill. We know that he has a plan and purpose for everything. We know that he's a good and loving God who can do anything. And because of that, when somebody else gets cancer and, and they get healed, we praise God. Even though our son, God didn't choose to heal him, we still praise God. We breathe, and of course, it still hurts, but we take refuge in the fact that God, the God who loves us, the God who let his son die for us, and you know what? We know a little bit about what that must have been like. We take refuge in a sovereign God who knows what he's doing. Listen, trusting in God's sovereignty, it is a huge, huge part of not envying other people. Because when you trust that God's in sovereign control of everything, you can believe, A, on your outline, that God gave you all you need. Let me say this again. God gave you all you need to be, all he wants you to be. Okay? God gave you all you need to be, all he wants you to be. Isn't that great? Third thing, live for an audience of one. Live for an audience of one. This is this, a Final proverb we look at, Proverbs chapter 23, verses 17 and 18. Great proverb. Do not let your heart envy sinners. There it is again. How do you not do that? But always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. So there's the antidote to envy. We, you know, we've talked about this almost every week, being zealous for the fear of the Lord. And we say, of course, that's not being afraid of God. That's not cowering in fear. That's not worried he's going to zap you if you step out of line. That's not at all what Proverbs means by fearing the Lord. Here's what it means. Fearing God means profoundly respecting him. It means honoring him and glorifying him. Fearing God means loving him and giving him the rightful place that he should have in our hearts. Fearing God is not ignoring him. It's not rebelling against him, but loving him and serving him and pleasing him with your life. You know what fearing God is? It's coming to the point where you realize, okay, you're God and I'm not. And I'm okay with that. That's what it takes. And when we fear God like that, we are much, much less likely to envy other people. And then the final antidote to the poison of envy is to run your own race. Run your own race. Look at, look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Great, great verse. Therefore, you know, therefore, it's pointing back to the chapter 11, the Hall of Fame, all these faithful, godly guys who've just been through so much and still trust in God. Therefore, chapter 12, verse 1, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of all those, those people, that witnesses, let us throw off everything 
that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, I want to draw your attention to that last little phrase, the race that is marked out for us. You know how God has a race marked out for you? It's like you're on this cross-country thing. You run around, oh, here's a flag. I'll run to this one. Here's a flag. Run. There's a race that he's got mapped out, marked out for you. And you know what? Your race is not my race. And my race is not your race. And God doesn't want me to run anybody else's race. He doesn't want you to run anybody else's race but your own race. And what do we need to do to run our own race and, and be successful in that and not fall down? We need to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Hey, let me ask you, what's a sin that could really in, entangle you and trip you up, as you heard this morning, from running your race? Envy. Yeah, envy. Looking at other people, how easy their race seems. No fair, you know, they're going downhill, I'm going uphill. You know, wanting what they have, wishing we were them, resenting who they are and what they've got, getting all embittered, getting all bent out of shape and being miserable. And you know what? We just can't run the race that way. You can't get very far that way. When you get entangled and tripped up and snagged and, and all bundled up in envy, you do that, you're hamstrung. You're hamstrung. You just can't go forward in the Christian life very well at all with envy. So with God's help, what do we need to do? We need to do whatever it takes to get rid of envy. To throw it off. To not let envy entangle us and hinder us in our walk on the race God has given us. Nancy Beach is the artistic uh, director of Willow Creek. And let me share a story she shares. I really like it. I'll, let me share it with you. She said this, In the winter, I run laps at the YMCA. There are three lanes. The walkers are supposed to stay on the inside lane, and the speed demons are on the outside lane, and the rest of us are in the middle. Sometimes I find myself looking over my shoulder to see a fast person coming. I think, they're not going to beat me, so I start running faster. If they do pass me, I think, they're not going to lap me another time, by golly. I start running way too fast for my own pace, and by the end of the run, I'm out of steam. Other days, when I run, there's a group who comes from a home for mentally challenged adults. And they come with big smiles on their faces, and they start walking slowly on the inside track. Sometimes they stop. Sometimes they start going the wrong way. I don't need to compete with the super speedy guys. And I don't need to compete with the slow, special needs adults. I need to run my own race. In church, people of Community Bible Church, that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do, to, to run our own race in order to finish the race that God has specifically marked out for you. And we need to remember, you know, you're not running this race by yourself. We're a team. We're running this race together. God's doing us in different directions, but we're all headed for the same goal. And one day, guys, this is so exciting. One day when we arrive in heaven, we are going to be able to say that we played a vital part in a movement of God in South Lafouche where scores of people came to faith in Jesus Christ. And we were able to run that race together because we absolutely refused to get dragged down. By the sin. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you so much. And Father, we know that like the, the great physician, you know what ails us. You know what trips us up, Lord. You, you know every in and every out of it. And Father, we thank you for uh, dissecting for us uh, this, this, this envy. And Father, we pray that, that if any of us this morning have, have some envy going on, that we will get rid of it. Lord, I pray that, that you would bring to the surface of our minds that there's somebody we're envious of. Lord, help us to deal with it and be free of that so we can run the race that you want us to run. And Father, again, we, 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 as we think about Good Friday coming, we're just horrified that this envy, this, some, this same thing that's kind of in our hearts sometimes, that's what killed your son Jesus. We know you allowed that to happen. You know it's part of your eternal plan, but that's what caused him to die, envy. So God, take it out of us. Perform the surgery. Give us the antidote. Lord, just help us to, to, to be rid of this poison of envy that, that threatens just to ruin our lives. Because God, we want to live our lives for you. 
and we want to be effective for you. We want to run the race you've given us. We want to be successful in that race. So, Father, we love you. We thank you. Give us your strength and power and grace. In Jesus' name we pray.